I invite you to join me in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We'll be considering together uh, verse 4. Especially this first phrase, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Tears are part of the human existence. We have all of us cried. And we will cry again. A brief look at the news will give us plenty of reasons why tears should be shed. We can see wars. We can see dreadful murders. Famines. Worries. We live in a world where there is much crying. But there is a place where that will no longer be the case. And that is in heaven, when we are with the Lord. What are tears? Why do we cry? Well, the scientific answer is that they are a mixture of water, sodium, carbon, chlorine, potassium, magnesium, with a trace of calcium. All land animals have the ability to produce tears. One of the most unusual are crocodiles, who cry when they eat. There are three types of tears, however. The first type are basal tears. And these are the tears that provide lubrication to our eye sockets, make sure that our eyes are wet and they protect our eyes. And then there are reflex tears, which is when we cry due to irritation, smoke, something in our eyes, onions. And then there are emotional tears, Only humans produce emotional tears. The only creature in the whole of God's creation that produces tears in in response to an emotion. This is yet another fact that confused Charles Darwin. He couldn't see the point. What physiological purpose do emotional tears carry? None. None. There are rare occasions where we may cry due to joy or due to laughter But the vast majority of the occasions occasions upon which we will cry will be because of a negative trigger, negative circumstance. But God says that he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What is the significance of these words? Why is it significant that he says that he will wipe away tears? Well, to understand that, I want to just go through a brief journey through the human life and look at some, not all, but some of the circumstances that may cause us to cry. I have ten. There are many others. The first is need. Nobody has to teach us how to cry, do they? It comes very naturally, starting at the beginning of our lives. We've been blessed with lots of babies in this church. We've got Clemmy and Indy and even Claudia and if you are a big brother or sister of a baby you'll be able to tell me something about them that they all cry don't they they all cry and they cry because they need something they cry out for their food they are deeply concerned that their needs are met they are desperate to fulfill their basic needs and they are worried they're concerned that they may not get what they need and it causes them to shed tears Now, we may grow out of that. We may not cry if we get hungry. But we do have a few basic needs, don't we? We need food, we need shelter, we need warmth. And we live in a very privileged society here in the UK. If you look back through history and through the world, what are we, the top 1% of the top 1% in terms of how many of our needs are met? We probably will never need to skip a meal most of us. And yet there are many people who cry because they're worried about food. Mothers that cry because they can't feed their children because they themselves don't have enough to eat. The children of Israel were brought to tears many times in the wilderness because they didn't know if their needs were going to be met. Now we may never cry due to lack of food, but the fact is, is that from the age of 18, we will all enter this endless cycle of working 
in order to provide our needs. We can get what we want, but it will cost us. It will cost us pressure. It will cost us concern. It will even cost us worry. And sometimes, I've come across a lot of people, they've shed tears because of the pressure of providing for their families. So the first is need, but it's not long before a child cries due to something else, and that is fear. They learn fear. I used to have a great fear of water, not drinking it, getting in it. One of my earliest memories is travelling down to Letchworth for swimming lessons and crying on the way. I hated it. Lots of children have fears. It's not a rational fear. On holiday this year, I went out with, I won't embarrass him, but I went out with one of my sons on a paddleboard. And we went out into the sea pretty deep. It was over 12 metres deep because there was a stick standing up. And they can swim, but I was trying to encourage them to jump off. And I may have, I may have rocked the paddleboard a little bit. And the result was tears. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might happen. And tears, tears, tears came. We may have many fears. And we might be able to keep them in check. We are, most of us, English people. Stiff up a lip. Don't show your emotions. But sometimes fear will intensify to the point where tears do come. A fear of what might happen. Thirdly, we've probably all experienced this betrayal. When we are betrayed, it can bring about tears. When we're let down by somebody that we thought that we could trust, somebody that we thought had our corner, somebody we thought had our back, and they desert us, they leave us, they start attacking us perhaps. I'm sure we'll all experience that at some point or another. David knew this feeling. When his son, his favourite son, the son upon whom he had doted, Absalom, he betrayed his own father. And we read as David fled in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 30, he went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and he wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot. The actions of another person were a dagger to his heart. I wonder, have you experienced that wrench? That sick feeling of being hurt by somebody that you thought you could trust? It can bring about tears. We may cry because of loss of a loved one. We will all, if we have not already, shed tears over the loss of somebody that we love, a family member or a friend. This will evoke into us deep and intense emotion and it will often result in tears, maybe in private, maybe only a few. But it hits us really hard. We see this all over the Bible time and time again. When J Jacob thought that Joseph had been killed, we read that he and all of his household wept bitterly. David was a man who cried very often. He was a man's man. He was a warrior and he cried. He cried when Saul died. He cried when Jonathan died. He cried when Abner died. He cried when his unborn son died. He cried when Absalom himself died. We can think of Mary at the sepulchre of Christ when she thought that her saviour had died. The one upon whom all of her hopes had been placed was in that tomb and she went and she wept because of that sense of loss. Dorcas was a beloved member of the community and many, many wept because she died. The loss of loved ones will cause us to cry and we can't avoid it. Fifthly, pain. Pain can bring us to tears. It's another fact of life that we will all experience pain. Now, children cry very easily at a scratch or a stinging metal. But even as we grow older, we may be brought to our knees. We may be brought to tears by pain, a bone that cracks, a ligament that snaps, an illness that takes hold of our body. I'm not too proud to admit that I've 
I've cried as a grown man because of pain. More than once, the last time I had a surgery on my knee, when I came round after the morphine, wet, um, morphine wore off, I cried. I wasn't blubbing, but the pain was so bad I couldn't stop the water coming out of my eyes. It's a very strange thing. Our bodies, no matter how well we look after them, they are fragile. They are temporary, and accident or illness can bring us to tears. Sixthly, and you might think this is a strange one, having children. Having children can cause us to weep. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, we read these words, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. I don't believe this is simply referring to childbirth. This is raising children. Children are our most wonderful blessing. They fill us with so much joy. Yet it's not long before these little creatures that we love so dearly, we realise that they have a grip on our heart and they can bring us to sadness. As they rebel against us, as we see them choose sin over righteousness, just like we did. As we see our flaws reflected back to us, and we think, we, I don't like that, but I know I gave it to you. As we see them so quickly absorb and imitate the world, ways of the world, when we're trying to encourage them to follow Christ, it can bring us to tears. When we realise how badly we as parents are failing these precious souls, I can say this because he's not here. I've only seen my dad cry once, and it was because of my wickedness. I brought him to tears, and it brings me shame. Mothers, in particular, are on the front line, raising children. It's hard, and it can often be totally overwhelming and bring us to tears. Seventhly, old age can bring about tears. Young people, right now, you might think you want to live forever. But from what I've observed, growing old is not much fun. In Psalm, Psalm 90, verse 10, we read these words. The days of our years be threescore and ten, seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. The feelings of our limbs that were once so strong not being able to do what they once did. The frustration of our mental faculties slipping away must be humbling. Lots of time spent pondering the things that we regret and wish we could change, seeing our friends die one by one. Must be a frightful thing to be old. It may bring about tears. Now it's true that many of these these sorrows can be tempered by having spiritual life. For the Christian, it's true that knowing that we have a God that will meet our every need is a great comfort. The one who will be with us wherever we go. We need not fear. The one that sticks closer than a brother and will never betray us. The one who will take all those that die in him safely to be with himself. The one who suffered more pain for us than we will ever know. The one that when our earthly tabernacle is eventually dismantled will take us to be with him in heaven. There is great comfort in being a child of God. And it's far better to go through our life with God. But it won't be the end of our tears. There will still be sorrows for the Christian. So eighthly, tears over sin. There must be that initial shedding of tears in repentance. That regret, that mourning over our sin. Blessed are they that mourn. That's what it's talking about here. But even when we're forgiven, even when our souls are safe in Christ, our sin will grieve us. Because we do still sin, don't we? And perhaps it's even more intense for the child of God. Think about Peter. who, When he denied the Lord Jesus Christ, he went out and he wept bitterly. 
for his sin. He hated it. It hurt him. It brought him to his tears. It brought him to tears. Or go back to David, who bore the results of his great sin with Bathsheba. Again and again and again in his life, he was reminded of it, and it caused him to cry. We will cry. We must cry over our sin. Psalm 6 and verse 6, a godly man writes this. A spiritual man writes this. I am weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. How about, ninthly, times of correction? The Christian will receive times of correction from God. No child enjoys receiving discipline from their father. If they do, their father isn't doing it right. But we read, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. As children of God, we do need the correction of our Heavenly Father. When we perhaps allow sin into our lives, when we neglect him, he may come in and bring about an affliction, a difficulty. And now he's doing it to conform us to the image of Christ. But when heavy pruning is required in our souls, it can bring us to tears. It's difficult. It's hard. And lastly, and tenthly, once we are saved, we have a concern for the lost that wasn't there before. A concern for the lost. Jeremiah is a book that is full of tears and weeping and crying because he cares for his people and they don't care for God. They reject him and it breaks his heart. Christ himself wept over Jerusalem. He looked out over Jerusalem. He knew they were going to reject him, reject him as the Messiah, and we read that he wept. The word there is clio. Literally, he wailed. He lifted up his voice and he was brokenhearted because of the lost that rejected the Saviour. How we who are believers, we agonise, don't we, over our friends and our loved ones that do not know Christ over parents, spouses, brothers, sisters, friends who reject God because we know what that means. How keenly parents feel for their children who are spiritually lost. If you're a Christian parent today and you have lost children, if you haven't cried over, you, over them, what is wrong with you? Unless they are saved, they are going to hell. And it brings us tears. The truth is, no matter how hard we try, no matter how rich we get, no matter how carefully we go about building the perfect life, we will not avoid tears in this life. Can there really be an end? Well, yes. There is an end to all tears for the child of God. There is a future for the child of God in which God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Do you not want that? Do you not want that, my friend? So let's just look at this statement in verse, in verse 4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I'd like to note three words, just three words in this statement. The first is that it's God. God himself will wipe away the tears of his people. This is too important for him to send one of his ministering angels to do. It is him himself, our king, our Lord, we may have an image of heaven in that it's God over there on a, on, a, on a throne and all the people gathered around him singing and that may well take place but what we have here is a, a picture of great intimacy. God himself wiping away our tears. Queen Elizabeth was much loved by many, perhaps rightly so. People have been thrilled to see her from a distance Catch a wave and imagine that it was for them. Queue for hours to file past her coffin. The heaven's king is the father of all mercies. She didn't wipe away our tears, no matter how good a queen she was. Heaven's king is the God of all grace, the God of all comfort. He's the one who we read in the Psalms, collects our tears in a bottle. This means that he knows our sorrows. He knows our pains. He feels our sadness. 
Not one sparrow falls to the ground without our Heavenly Father knowing. And beloved Christian, not one tear rolls down your cheek without the Lord Jesus Christ, without God the Father, knowing it, noticing it, treasuring it, storing it, and compensating for it in heaven. He knows our every tear. God will wipe away the tears. The second word I'd like to draw your attention to is shall. This is in the future. God shall wipe away. For now we are still in the conflict. We must still do battle with sin. We must bear our crosses for him. We must accept the afflictions that he assigns to us. We must shed tears as we intercede for our loved ones. For my Christian brother and sister, the best is yet to come. How sad it is, how pitiable it is, if this life, with all of its ups and downs, was to be our high point. I was reading an article that, and it's an opinion article, that, it, and the, they believe that women reach their peak in their early 20s and men in their late 40s. Please don't shoot the messenger. But how sad would that be if that was the case? If that was really our high point? And it will be. It will be for many who choose to indulge and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season instead of being numbered with the people of God. That's your high point. For the Christian, it's to come. There's a wonderful illustration of this at the wedding in Cana. When the Lord Jesus Christ does his first miracle, they run out of wine. And the Lord Jesus, he intercedes and he makes water into wine. And when the governor tastes of this wine, he is bemused. Why is this wine best? Because what we do in the world is we give our best first. And then, well, it, it tails off. God's way is to put the best last. That is the way of sin, isn't it? Best first, best up front. Don't worry about what might happen later. It always dresses up as appealing and tempting. And there may be somebody here that is really tempted and is perhaps giving in to that temptation to chase sin because it looks wonderful. Yeah, it, it does. But what comes afterwards is not. You will find no proof that people have come out on the good side of indulging in sin. God's way is to save the best until last. He promises difficulty. He promises affliction. He promises struggle. And yes, he promises to be with us. But we find that it ends in a tearless, joyful bliss. And these promises aren't empty. We've got thousands of years of history in our Bibles that prove that God keeps his promises. I urge you, when you're choosing the emphasis of your life, joy today or joy in the future, count on God. Do it his way. Thirdly, look at the word all. He won't wipe away some of our tears, or even most of our tears, all of our tears. We can read this as God shall wipe out all of their tears. Not just wipe them away, not dab them, not just comfort, get rid of them. Get rid of them completely. Get rid of the root cause. Remove the need to ever cry again. A complete wiping away, a forever wiping away of tears. There will be no more cause of tears because there will be no more sin. All of that list can be traced back to sin. Tears are the result of sin and there is no sin in heaven. Its guilt, its effect and its influence has been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and it will not be permitted to be in his kingdom. Let's carry on reading. There shall be no death, no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. It's a wonderful thought that all tears could be wiped away. But God's word doesn't just tell us wonderful things. It doesn't just give us doctrine. It demands a response. 
So, as we've thought about this place, this time, what must our response be? Now, please give me your attention as a few sleepyheads respond to this text. The first thing we need to do is ask ourselves, am I a citizen of this kingdom? Will I be there? This place where there are no more tears. We're told who will be there in verse 24. The nations of them which are saved. And in verse 27, there's a further definition of what these people are. There is an exclusion There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Nothing that can defile it. Anything dirty, anything sinful, not allowed. Zero tolerance. All impurity, not allowed. And included, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you a citizen? of this kingdom if you cannot say that you are you must consider the alternative the alternative if this is a place where there is no crying the alternative is a place where there is nothing but crying nothing but tears there is a phrase used by the Lord Jesus Christ many many times in all the gospels talks about hell And it's a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not a kingdom. It's not the devil's kingdom. It's just a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Somebody was telling me about the sermon they heard just on those phrases, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it went on to say that there are two people in hell, two types of people in hell. Those that are gnashers, those that are angry, those that can't believe they've got there, and those that are weeping, those that are full of regrets, those who knew the way to not be there, and yet they chose sin instead, and they are there, and they can do nothing but weep. That's the alternative if you're not a citizen of heaven. Well, how can I become a citizen of heaven? How do I apply? Susanna and I have just applied for passports for our children. We're hoping to go and visit some people in France. And it's really difficult. You need to get just the right picture. We need to get somebody else, somebody that isn't a relation to us, to verify that the children are who they say they are. Then you need to send something off. off. Good luck with the postal strikes. And we're hoping they're going to be here in time. It's complicated. How do we apply to be a citizen of heaven? Well, notice whose book it is. It's the Lamb's book of life. He's the author. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author. And he is still taking applications. You must simply come to Christ through prayer. Acknowledge that in your current state, you would defile heaven. Because you are dirty, you are sinful, just like every human being. You can't come in as you are. Ask him to cleanse you and give you a pure heart fit you for heaven and add your name to his book of life and he will that's the first response to the teaching of this text will we be there and the second is for the children of god if that is you and may the holy spirit hide this text in your heart as we go from this place of worship and we go back to our busy lives go back to the tears Go back to the difficulty. Go back to the things that bring us low and bring us down. May we go on in the strength of these words and look forward to the day when we will at last be with the Lord Jesus Christ and all tears will be wiped away. I was spoilt for choice in choosing a last hymn here, but I've avoided one that I often choose, but I will quote from it. It's by Henry Francis Light, and I'll close with this verse. This is what the children of God can sing. Come joy or come sorrow, whatever may befall, an hour with my God will make up for it all. The road may be rough, but it will not be long. I'll walk it by faith while rejoicing in song. Amen.
Let's close by singing hymn number 622. 622.